surprise when I announced the arrival of Professor Datin Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, who will be chairing the lecture, and uh, the arrival of Professor Dr. Jamia Hassan. So kindly remain standing for the national anthem and UM song upon their arrival. And as a support for Prof. Dr. Jamia, I would appreciate very much if you can remain in the auditorium till the end of the lecture. And I would also like to remind everyone to switch off your mobile phones or please set your phones to silent mode to avoid any interference during the lecture. So your cooperation is very much appreciated. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Announcing the arrival of Professor Datin Dr. Adiba Kamarud Zaman, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and Professor Dr. Jamia Hassan from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good afternoon. Professor Datin Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, distinguished guest, Professor Dr. Jamia Hassan, Management of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Jamia Hassan entitled Viva La Ova, The Journey. And to pave the journey, for this afternoon, we present Lee Zin Yang, a third year MBBS student, who will be presenting I Will Survive on his violin. Lee Zin Yang. Mm -hmm. 
much Ziyang. That is in true Prof. Jamie style. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, I, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Datin Dr. Adiba to chair the lecture and to introduce Professor Dr. Jamia Hassan. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Hamima. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now, if you, uh, if you are someone who grew up in the uh, disco era, like I guess Jamie, you and I did, uh, you would know how difficult it was to maintain decorum and sit there and not jump up and, and dance to that, I will survive. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but yeah, I had to master all my decorum as dean to sit still in my chair. So Ziyang, um, congratulations. And, and yes, in true Prof Jami style, that was quite a surprise. But um, I think it, it um, kind of uh, introdu introduces the, the exact opening, which was what I wanted to say in introducing Prof Jami, that um, you know, the success of, a, of an organization, whether it's a, it's a corporate organization or an, a, a, a state academic institution like the University of Laya, depends on the talents within it. And, and this is when I get very emotional. And, and, uh, and you just saw a talent in an up and coming and budding uh, doctor. Ziyang has got another three years to go, but uh, the talent within it, as, as you'll hear from uh, the person we're going to honor today in, in, in Professor Jamia Hassan, is I'm sure many of you will agree that uh, despite the market forces, we've been able to retain someone like uh, Prof. Jami to, uh, to serve the faculty, to serve the patients, and, and to train the next generation of uh, medical students and, and specialists. 
So Prof Jami is a, is a homegrown uh, UM graduate who graduated from UM in 1985 and was also probably one of the pioneers uh, in terms of clinical masters and, and uh, obtained her obstetrics and gynecology specialty and subsequently subspecialty all here apart from a, a, a relatively brief stint at the Royal Hammersmith in London. And she returned to um, really serve the faculty in the hospital with distinction. Um, several years ago, you all remember her as a deputy director, a very strict deputy director, I must say. Uh, I was uh, a head of infectious disease and she would come and tell us off for, for not doing things. Um, and, and under her stewardship as a deputy director of clinical services, I think we saw many improvements uh, at PPUM. She, uh, within her specialty, she established the baby, um, baby friendly unit that's still, um, uh, of course, a, a very important um, component of the obstetrics and gynecology department. And she's also been instrumental in ensuring the training of not just um, uh, obstetricians, but also ultrasonographers, and, and now uh, takes the lead in the Samsung Ultrasonography School um, that we established last year. In the last few years, she has fortunately been uh, focusing her skills and her dedication and her passion, I should say, in, in helping us uh, really focus our attention to what I feel is our, one of our core businesses, which is um, producing the best uh, medical graduates in the country. Um, with the revamping of the curriculum, uh, Prof Jami uh, has really taken the lead in ensuring that uh, the clinical skills component of uh, medical training is, is uh, well looked after. She heads the clinical skills unit. I know Jami, the um, uh, the equipment within the clinical sk skills unit is not what you would expect the premier medical school in this country to be, but I hope we've got some generous donors in the room who will feel sorry for us and, and uh, maybe feel moved to, uh, to support the clinical skills unit, which is a very expensive um, outfit, but uh, it's something that we need to upgrade. But she has really, Prof Jami has really gone beyond the call of duty in terms of making sure that the uh, the lessons, the, um, the training done in the clinical skills unit is fun um, and uh, really beneficial to the students. She's also really taken it upon herself to, um, to take the, the, the undergraduate students for Bhakti Siswa, which is really one of our signature community service um, that's performed by the students and she's taken them into the uh, outbacks of uh, Sabah and uh, other places for vaccination programs to the rural area and, and I think the students who have been on this um, Bhakti Siswa program have um, had their training very much enriched through uh, Prof Jami's initiative um, uh, in, in, in this program. They not only have to do the vaccination and, and live with the uh, rural folks, but they've also had to uh, raise funds through concerts and things. So it's, it's really a, a, a very en enriching and, and uh, important program for the faculty, which is beyond the lectures and the tutorials that you know, a, a standard medical program uh, is, is uh, commonly known to give. Um, I could go on and on about uh, her contrib Prof Jami's contribution to the faculty and, and, and to, um, to the university, but uh, you can all read it from the program. But uh, suffice to say that, uh, you know, um, again, as I said, we're very fortunate here at the faculty, and I just reminded our 135 new medical students the other day that there is no other faculty of medicine in the country that um, has you know, the, the staff strength and, and, and passion and dedication and experience as that of the Faculty of Medicine. And I think um, Prof Jami is, is one of the faces of uh, that, um, uh, that, you know, that, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the edge that we have above every other Faculty of Medicine in this country. So we all look forward to your speech, uh, Jami, and uh, I don't know what other surprises you have for us this afternoon, 
but we look forward to a, a very aptly uh, named lecture, Viva La Ova. Thank you very much, Prof. Adiba, for that kind introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to my inaugural lecture. And uh, I appreciate your time, taking time off from your busy schedule to come and listen to me. You know, I chose this title, Viva La Ova, The Journey, because I like to celebrate today the life of many women, women that I know, women that I do not know, but I just like, before I start, I'd just like to introduce the picture of my book, is a girl, which I scanned 10 years ago when she was 32 years old. So I'd like to introduce to you Laksana. Please stand up, Laksana. So please help me welcome <laughs> Laksana, who's actually the 3D picture of my book. Thank you very much for coming, Laksana. As I said just now, my lecture is a tribute to women. Women who are passionate about their work, women who are resilient, multitasking, and do a lot of things sometimes in silence. And I like to celebrate just now, as I say, women of all walks of life. My boss, my friends, my enemies maybe, but today I will celebrate your life. This is the tribute to you, and especially so to all the women in University of Malaya who are in the workforce and you are doing an awesome job, and you are always multitasking. And you know, woman in the 21st century wants to do so many things. She wants to be CEO, she wants to be the dean, she also wants to be the prime minister, and she also wants to go to the moon. But yet, we also need to get pregnant, unfortunately, because to bring up a family, the woman is the only one that can get pregnant unless you can get the men pregnant. So therefore, women are multitasking. There's a lot of things to do. So for this half an hour or so, I hope, I'm just going to take you through to the stages of pregnancy, which is my subspecialty. So taking you through the ultrasound, the stages of pregnancy, and the way fetuses grow in the uterus. But at the same time, I'm going to tell you about the risk of pregnancy. Women can still die during pregnancy. We'll take you through maternal mortality. But as I said just now, I work in the field of women. So I'm passionate about women. So one of my other special interests in reproductive health, which is contraception, family planning, vaccination, and menopause. So I'll just cover that towards the end. And finally, I'll just end with a short journey of my life in University of Malaya. The title is a little bit catchy, Viva La Ova. Somebody asked me, Italian title, Jamie? Not really, because I'm celebrating the life of women which starts from the ova. All of you women here and outside there who are maybe listening to me, the, ova, the maximum ova a woman has is actually in the fifth month of pregnancy when you are in the mom's womb. You have about five million ova then. By the time you are born, there's only about one or two million ovas. And by the time you attain menarche, there may be 200,000, not more than 500,000. Where are the rest? They all die off. But you still have enough ovas to last your lifetime. You must be privileged. You need only one ova to get pregnant. But men have to, to produce millions of sperm to compete for that one ova. So that's how privileged you are. But once an ova, once a sperm penetrates the ova, and that's when the, the, the ova is also loyal, so no other sperm can penetrate, unless when a sperm penetrates, then that can give rise to complication in pregnancy. So when there's conception that occurs, then you have formation of cycle. That's where the journey, as I said just now, of a woman starts from the ova in conception of a female fetus. Of course, I'm not ignoring the male fetus, but we're going to talk mainly about female at the moment. So the journey will start from an awesome ova that can last only 24 hours for conception. Beyond that, it will die off, and if it, can, if it will not last too long. And in contrast, the male sperm can last for about five days in the vagina. And if you have a one-night stand, 
and you think you are safe, think again. There are a few thousands male sperm that are still hovering around that can catch your ova during ovulation. So during the first eight weeks of embryogenesis, that's where the structures of the fetus are all formed in the first eight weeks. And after that is maturation of the fetus or growth of the structures. So fetal anomalies, if it happens later on, usually starts from the embryogenesis period. But you know, pregnancy is unique. Sometimes when you think about it, the success of pregnancy depends on the immune tolerance of the woman because 50% of the genetic material actually comes from the men. And how is that the woman can protect the growing embryo to make sure it's not being expelled from her womb? That's the beauty of God. And that's the beauty of pregnancy because the maternal immune system now needs to modulate to protect this growing fetus. If it doesn't do that, then we'll have a problem. Where the interface of this active modulation is where at the point of before implantation, that's where the mum, the fetal maternal interface happens to protect the fetus. So one of the things that occurs is maternal systemic maternal immune suppression. And you know that to protect that, the, um, the cytoblasts actually do not possess HLA antigen A and B. And if they have the HLAG, it undergoes pleomorphism. Why does it do that? So that the mum doesn't detect that something foreign is growing into her womb and does not expel the fetus. Only the inner cell mass has the HLA antigen. But that's not about it. You know, at the point of implantation, the fetus needs to burrow in into the endometrium sort of to sort of, uh, so you can say to glue into the endometrium. But for it to happen, it needs to burrow in. And for it to burrow in, first stage of pregnancy that needs to happen is a pro-inflammatory process, what we call as TH1 environment. And TH1 environment is necessary for implantation process. But after that, TH2 environment needs to come in because this is a shift from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory process. Why? Because if it doesn't happen, then you can get a problem as like, for example, miscarriage or recurrent miscarriages. But the pregnancy, the, the ovaries, the corpus luteum also produce progesterone. And progesterone is very important. Why? Well, one, it keeps the pregnancy quiescent, the uterus quiescent, so it doesn't expel the fetus. But it also produces progesterone inducing blocking, uh, progesterone induced blocking factor. What does it do? It protects against the fetus. And also there's asymmetric antibodies because we know asymmetric antibodies can detect detection and they're not toxic, whereas symmetric antibodies are toxic. So when you look at it, in the first trimester, the women run the risk of miscarriages. So 15% of clinically recognized pregnancy end up with miscarriages. But usually, if you we, we thank you very much. He always tell me, so you better make sure that it doesn't drop behind you. So 15% of clinical recognized pregnancy ends up miscarriage. And most of the time, the causes of miscarriage can be many. Among them are genetic problem or chromosomal abnormality or gross structural abnormality. But there is a small group of the population, about 3% or so, has recurrent miscarriages, maybe due to uh, thrombophilia, infections, endocrine, but quite a proportion of them are due to unexplained miscarriage. When they have unexplained miscarriage, then we need the help of my colleague, a reproductive colleague, to help this couple to see whether or not they can help this couple getting pregnant. Look at this one. This is Prof Jaffa's uh, video. He's trying to catch the sperm, the grade A sperm, the sperm that swims straight, the Superman sperm, good grades, and to inject them into that ova for conception. And some couple will need the help from the reproductive health expert. But at the same time, once my re reproductive health expert gets so good with their work, when they reach 
more than 50% clinical pregnancy rate and more than 30% take-home baby rate, we will also have a problem in terms of dealing with their multiple pregnancy, which I will elucidate later on. More than 40 years ago, ultrasound is something that is not a common practice. It's not incorporated into standard management in pregnancy. But now, ultrasound is available in all the general hospitals in this country, even in all district hospitals in this country, it becomes a standard of care. Ultrasound has improved the way we care for pregnant women, and one of the role of ultrasound in first trimester is to confirm the pregnancy, to look for the number of fetuses, and in multiple pregnancy, to assess the coronacity and amniocity because this is very important in our management and before without the use of ultrasound we'll have a problem in this area but also to detect gross fetal abnormalities to do any ploidy screening and of course invasive testing. I will talk a little bit about uh, the knuckle translucency as part of aneuploidy screening. This is what I do and what my colleagues in fetal maternal medicine do. I'd just like to acknowledge Prof. Jamil here is from UKM here, one of my counterpart in fetal maternal medicine. So most of the times, and also as sonographers in the audience, so what are the things we do first to look at the fetus and to date the fetus? In the first trimester, dating is very accurate. The error of the scan is within two to five days. But after the first trimester, that after 12 weeks or so, the error scan can go up to one week to 10 days. And this is just looking at the fetus using the 3D and the 4D mode. I'll just take you through to some of the things that we do in ultrasound. So in the first trimester, we look at the fetus and we check the fetal heart. We make sure there is no gross fetal abnormality in the first trimester. But at the same time, you also look whether there are any problems in the pelvis, looking for whether or not there's any whether or not there's any ovarian masses or uterine fibroids. Now this is a little bit bigger, looking at the fetus a little bit bigger, and uh, even you can see the face, you can see the arms, the hands. With the use, with the advances of ultrasound nowadays, looking at fetal anomaly in the first trimester can be quite easy. This is slightly bigger fetus, this is about 13 weeks fetus. You can see the head nicely, and you can even see the face, the back of the fetus, and the fetus jumping around, and this is where we try to catch a fetus freeze in a freeze frame to take the measurements of a knuckle translucency or, or looking at the crown rum length, which I'll show you in a while. Some of the fetal anomalies that we can detect in the first trimester, nowadays it's not good to just take an ultrasound and just put an ultrasound probe on the mum's tummy and say, your fetus is fine by looking just at a fetal heart. Many years ago, that's what people do. As long as there's fetal heart, your baby is fine, but that's not the case today. Once you pick up the ultrasound machine, and you should know how to scan, at least to find out the basic norm, and you must be able to, to assess the fetus properly, at least to find out whether there's any gross fetal abnormality. And look here, I'll just take you to some of the abnorm abnormality. This is a prune belly syndrome where they have megacystis. And this is uh, looking at this cystic hygroma. And this is where the fetus at 13 weeks old has a proboscis. And when you karyotype the fetus, when they have proboscis, most of the time the likelihood of problem will be trisomy 13. And this is a holoprotencephaly. And the same fetus has proboscis, which is a single nostril. And this is trisomy 13. And this is where you look at the increased narcotranslucency, translucency, which I will elucidate in a while. And this is a fetal without a fetal head. And this is what we call an encaphaly, and they don't survive. Nowadays, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be uh, diagnosing an encaphaly at 36 weeks. That is a catastrophe. But we still get referrals uh, from patients where the an encaphaly was diagnosed very late. It can be diagnosed by about 12 weeks or so. I was talking just now about ultrasound markers in pregnancy. You need to try and identify which fetuses are at risk of chromosomal anomalies. In the olden days, when we talk about chromosomal anomalies, the simplest thing chromosomal anomalies is Down syndrome. Usually in the olden days, we offer women above 35 years old invasive testing in trying to identify a group of women who carries a Down syndrome child because as we said, the risk is higher when they grow older. Why is it the risk is higher when women grow old in terms of chromosomal anomaly? Because the ova in us is as old as us. 
as I said just now, the ova is maximum at 20 weeks gestation. By the time you are born, it's only one million or two. So that means if you are 40 years old, your egg is 40 years old. In contrast to male, their sperms is freshly produced within three months or so. They will not have a sperm that's older than six months. So that's not fair, isn't it? Man gets the best. Even though they're 90 years old, their sperm is six months old. <laughs> but life is not always fair. Sometimes we have to take it as what it is. So when a woman grows older, the risk of chromosomal anomaly increases. So in, in the olden days, we offer women invasive testing, amniocentesis or CVF, to look for trisomy 13. But Nicolaides, in somewhere in 1990s, observed a group of pregnancy who does not want any termination, and he observed that these fetuses has increased knuckle translucency behind the neck. What does it mean? It means that when we do a scan, we see an area, an acolucent area, which look dark, and that means it's fluid behind the neck. And they did not do anything. They did not want any termination. So when they are born, when these fetuses are born, a substantial of them actually ended up in Down syndrome. That's how this knuckle translucency come about as a non-invasive screening. Because even though the higher age woman has a high risk of Down syndrome, but the majority of Down syndrome, two thirds of them are born in younger age women because well, the younger age women are the main one that in the reproductive age group. By introducing non-invasive testing, now we can use it as screening. So we offer knuckle translucency to everybody who is pregnant, and if they are increased risk, if the knuckle translucency is more than 2.5 or they're 3 millimeters, 4 millimeters or so, this will increase the age-related risk of that woman of carrying a chromosomal abnormal baby like Down syndrome, trisomy 13 or 18, and we offer invasive testing to these group. So in that case, in that sense, we will not miss the younger woman in terms of chromosomal anomaly testing. But Hyatt, I, I worked with Hyatt in a while when I was in the United Kingdom before, and he actually, he was, uh, uh, he was only a SHO, but it's a very good one. So he did a study looking at the knuckle translucency with a normally euploid fetus, that means a normal chromosome, and he followed up these fetus, and he finds that 30% of these fetus end up with cardiac anomalies. So now if you have an increased knuckle translucency, you have a euploid fetus, we will still subject the fetus to an, to an echocardiography to check for cardiac anomalies. So when you, when you see, when the first trimester cardiac anomaly scan, we can do a cardiac anomaly scan in the first trimester, but the heart is very small. At 20 weeks, it's only one centimeters, that big, but at, 13 weeks or so is only about half of that, four or five centimeters, so it's very small. So when the heart beats at 140 beats per minute, and it's only the size of five to six millimeter, and you want to look for cardiac anomaly, it's very difficult. Therefore, the pickup rate of cardiac anomaly is not very high, probably just 50% or so. But there are the markers that we look for. We look for tricuspid valve regurgitation or abnormal flow in ductus venosus at that stage. Now, if there are abnormal ductus venosus flow or tricuspid regurgitation with an increased NT, then this will increase the risk of fetal anomalies. And hence, of course, we need to offer this patient uh, uh, invasive testing. Let me just see whether this will work. Just want to show you how we do a fetal heart anomaly in the 13 weeks. It's not easy to do when the fetal heart is very, very small. It's only at five millimeter diameter, but at the same time beating at about 150 per minute. When the, when the fetus are bigger, then you can see the definition of the organ much bigger. Then we can look at the different, different organs, looking at the spine, the liver, or looking at the kidneys, heart, and so on. Now, I just want you to take a look at this picture. This is looking at the intracranial structures of the brain. Just watch the eyes. Look at these eyes of this baby. And you can see that the eye suddenly moves. I should play it again. Just watch the eyes. And sometimes it's interesting to see the fetuses having two. It's okay. 
I'm just going to move to now looking at the heart in the in the fetus at about 20, 22 weeks. Compared to just now at 13 week size, this heart is much bigger and it's much easier to see and it's much easier to see for fetal anomalies. But looking at the heart using uh, black and white uh, ultrasound sometimes can be difficult because the heart moves. So we use this color Doppler to try and help us identify whether there are any abnormalities in the connections of the heart, in the vessels of the heart. And ultrasound has gone a long way uh, in helping us to take care of fetuses in pregnancy. This is just looking at the fetus nose and lips. And uh, even though cleft lip and palate actually has the lowest risk of chromosome anomaly, one in a thousand chance, but it has the highest emotional impact to the patient. Whenever they have cleft lip and palate, the impact to the mum and the relative surrounding is great. But nowadays, cleft lip and palate is easily taken care of. We have a fantastic team of surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, plastic surgeons, in the department of uh, maxillofacial and the dentistry, which helps us to take care of these fetuses before they're even one year old. All the surgery are done as soon as possible with very little scarring. I'd just like to take to you, I'd just like to take you through some of the fetal abnormalities that we see in our scanning every day. So this is looking at the fetus, which is this are the kidneys, and you see these kidneys, they are enlarged renal pelvis, the severe hydronephrosis. And you look at this fetal, this is the fetal skull, and there is a defect in the hospital region and the herniation of the brain into this defect. You can see a cleft lip on a black and white, and you see a cleft lip on the 3D scan. This is again, this is a bigger fetus with, uh, with a, a nancaphaly. This is a fetus who came to us with microcolon, and usually microcolon, they have very poor uh, prognosis. And this fetus is what we call, whenever we see pictures like this, patients always say, does it look a face? But it's not a face. This is actually the bladder. You can see a urine spurting down there. So this is a double bubble. And double bubble, when you have a double bubble uh, signs on ultrasound, the risk of chromosomal anomaly is about 20%, and they're usually Down syndrome trisomy 21, and we will advise patients for invasive testing. Advice doesn't mean that the patient will take our advice, but we will recommend invasive testing. This is uh, omphalocele. This is a multicystic kidney, but looking at the multicystic kidney, the other kidney is completely normal. If you have bilateral multicystic kidney, the prognosis is very poor. They usually die or because of lung problems, and they will not survive. But if they have one only unilateral multicystic kidney with one completely normal, the chances of survival is very good. And this is what we call placenta acquita. You see this one, this is the bladder, this is a placenta. The placenta looks very angry with vessels impinging into the bladder wall. In, in when I was training before, many, many years ago, we see placenta acquita or proquita maybe once in a year. But now in our department, we see placenta acquita maybe once a month. And the mor morbidity with placenta acquita is huge. And the reason why placenta equita increases because the increase of tissue infection in Malaysia, in our hospital, around the world. And nowadays, that's the reason why the prevalence of placenta equita increases. When you have placenta equita or procreta, the patient run a risk of massive uh, hemorrhage. They will lose the uterus. They may even lose part of the bladder. And that's where we'll call our friend to come in and help us. The other area where ultrasound is very useful is in the area of multiple pregnancy. As I said, the multiple pregnancy has also increases because our colleague with the reproductive technique has gone so good and increases the dichorionic pregnancies, but the monochorionic pregnancies usually are stable, are also increased around the world. When you have multiple pregnancy, it's highly important that we try to assess the chorionicity and amniocenicity in the early pregnancy. Why is it? Because knowing the amniocenicity and chorionicity is key to the management, especially when you have one fetus that's dead inside or you need to selectively fetocyte one, you need to know exactly what they are. And ultrasound is very, very important in this respect. Why is it so? Ultrasound in the first trimester has 100% accuracy in terms of elucidating the chorionicity and amniocenicity. And looking at this particular publication was a long time ago. And 
in the second trimester, all these all this, uh, images or, or appearance of the chronicity may disappear in the dark chorionic tunes. Why is it very important? You look at this particular paper. When you have dichorionic multiple, when we have dichorionic twins, dizygotic twins are always dichorionic, and their risk is much lower than monozygotic twins. But monozygotic twins are not always monochorionic. One third of monozygotic twins will be dichorionic, and they will behave as a dizygotic twins. Therefore, in essence, in us day-to-day -day practice, dizygosity is not important for us to elucidate chorionicity is important, simply because if you look at this, when you have dichorionic pregnancies, it may be dizygotic or monozygotic. The risk, like perinatal loss, is lower than monochorionic pregnancy, similarly to other antenatally acquired cerebral lesions like necrosis or IGR is much higher in monochorionic pregnancies. And this is the signs that we look for in the first trimester. This is what we call lambda signs, where there is uplifting of the placenta at the point uh, when there is two placenta together. Then you see this sign is called lambda sign. And therefore, when you see a lambda sign, it's 100% is diachronic pregnancy, meaning to say the fetus does not share the placenta. Therefore, when they do not share the placenta, the chances of blood uh, anastomosis is very small or even not there. And this particular pregnancy, twin pregnancy, there is a very thin line, what we call a T sign, and this is always monochoronic pregnancy. In the second trimester, the lambda sign will disappear in about 20% of patients. Therefore, they may be dichorionic, but you do not see the lambda sign in the second trimester. So you look for other signs. You look for genitalia, you look for thickening of membrane. It's very difficult to look for thickening, but genitalia, dizygous twin can have light sex, so it'd be very difficult. And sometimes the placenta can be very close together, so it's still very difficult to look. Monochoronic twins, the complications are when you have single twin demise, when you have uh, twin to twin transfusion syndrome, you also increase risk of neurodevelopmental delay, or trap sequence are elucidated in a while, and also they can end up in conjoined twins or monoamniotic twins. This one is just to show, just to show you, this is triplet pregnancy, and this little one is not alive, and there's no, it's, no, it's single uh, triplet demise. So these are the complications in multiple pregnancy that we see in our unit. And looking at this is a, this is a conjoined twin on a 3D scan. Now this is a twin with two faces, and this, they are not common, they are rare. A conjoined twin, a twin with a polyhydramnion sequence, a monoamniotic twin with caught entanglement. This usually occurs with one single placenta and single sac. And you see this one, where it's conjoined twin on, on 3D, and you can see it's quite clearly. Let me just talk to you about trap sequence. This is a rare complication of monochorionic twins. Does trap sequence mean a twin reverse arterial perfusion sequence? Why is that so? Well, you see there's an underdevelopment of the trap twin, or what we call the perfuse A cardiac twin. And the normal twin is usually called a pump twin. Because there is a reverse arterial perfusion, the umbilical artery goes into the, the fetus carrying the deoxygenated blood. The umbilical vein carries the oxygenated blood. When there is reverse, the, the oxygenated blood is now carried by umbilical artery, which goes down towards the bladder. So the bottom half of the fetus are well developed compared to the upper half, because now there is the reverse sequence. So for, you, for us to diagnose trap sequence, there are a few criteria that we need to meet. One is there must be a monochoronic placenta. Two, there is a reverse perfusion, meaning the umbilical artery now carries the oxygenated blood the other way around. And also they are, have velamentous cord insertion. And of course, there's a discordant development in the A cardiac twin with the lower half more developed than the upper half, and they usually do not have a heart. That's why you say a cardiac. But nowadays we say a trapped sequence rather than a cardiac. If you leave it untreated, the mortality is 100%. The palm twin will die. The perfused twin, of course, will, uh, the, the a cardiac twin will not survive. But the palm twin will die from cardiac failure and all its complications. 
How do you manage them? Well, one of the management is to ablate the acardiac twin so that to kill it off intrauterine. So what do we do? This is to show you one of the fetus uh, I had uh, a few years ago. And this is an acardiac fetus, and they have a polyhydramnia here. And you can see that there's a reverse arterial sequence where the umbilical artery actually carries the oxygenated blood into the a cardiac twin, making the a cardiac twin growing bigger and bigger, and the, the normal pump twin growing smaller and smaller. You can see that there is only there is no heart. You see the lower bottom is well developed. So what do we do? So we offered ablation. So what can you do? How can you ablate this twin? Well, you can ablate by embolization, or you can ablate by cord ligation, or we can do laser coagulation or diatomy using bipolar or monopolar. But this is quite difficult. The risk to the surviving twin can be high. So many years ago, we wrote a paper on alcohol ablation. And uh, one of the first few papers that come out with alcohol ablation into the acardiac twin. Why is this easier to do? Because the umbilical artery goes into the acardiac twin, which can, we can identify quite easily on ultrasound. So what do we do? So this patient, this patient is actually a preemie gravida presented to us with acardiac fetus with a normal pump twin and a small IGI polyhydramnios. And this is the acardiac twin. This is the pre-procedure. So we ablate with 100% alcohol injected into the, uh, um, into the portion of umbilical artery that going into the liver. It's much easier to do that because if you do it wrong, then it will go to the pump twin and it will kill the pump twin. So this is pre-procedure where we inject the acardiac twin with absolute alcohol, 100%. Then you look through, where you follow through with the Doppler, and slowly the, the blood vessel is occluded with the ablated with the 100% alcohol, and it doesn't show any more flow. So what happens? We delivered this fetus when into this mom went into labor at 32 weeks. So we delivered her by C-section. So this is the A cardiac twin. This is where we ablate. And you can see that the, the, uh, the cord is actually running through the vessels at the villamentous insertion. And usually they, are, they have marginal insertion. And you see the eight cardiac features are quite developed, the lower half, but the upper half is not, is not formed. So what happens? So this is the twin. This is the palm twin. And this is at 42 days before she left our special care nursery. And this is at two years old. Now she's at six years old and she has a little brother. So if we leave these people alone, this trap twin sequence alone, usually they end up with completely losing the pregnancy. As I said just now, pregnancy are not without risk. We can die during pregnancy. A woman can die during pregnancy, during delivery, or during postpartum period, unless we can share the risk with the guys. And the guys can get pregnant, with one year is your turn, and the next two years is my turn, but that's not going to happen. Even if we trans transfer the uterus in the guys, I'm not so sure it will happen. So around the world, half a million women die during childbirth every year. And even one woman die during childbirth is a catastrophe if we can prevent it. If thousands of women die during childbirth in Africa, it's just a statistic. If one woman dies in childbirth in London, it'll be a big mess. Everybody will be hauled up. So it's a matter of numbers. But I think even one woman die during childbirth is important for us to try and reduce. Therefore, women, before you get pregnant, make sure you are healthy. Make sure you take educate diet. Don't eat for two, don't eat for three. Enough nutrients. Make sure you take your folic acid to reduce the risk of neurotube defects in pregnancy because you need to load your body with folic acid. Regular exercise. If you are smoking, stop smoking. If you are vaping, please don't vape. I'm not so sure whether vaping is good, but if you are smoking, stop smoking because we have published a paper recently to show that smoking also does not help and it can give rise to intrauterine restriction. Well, try to keep, no, I don't say try to keep slim, but make sure your BMI is in the ideal range. Now, even if you are BMI in, in a range of class one, let's say, obesity, if you reduce your weight even to less than five kilogram in that pregnancy, you will still reduce the risk of pregnancy with obesity like hypertension or uh, gestational diabetes 
or macrosomia, and of course, cesarean section. So that it pays to reduce the risk and also plan your pregnancy. We want to plan the pregnancy so that we don't get pregnant every year. So we don't get pregnant when too young and we don't get pregnant when too old. I have a patient a few years ago and she's 54 and she still have her period. And she came to me one day and she said, I think I missed my period, but I think I'm entering perimenopause. So I said, okay, let's see you. And I found that she's pregnant and she was crying. I said, can you please take away this baby because my daughter-in-law is also pregnant. <laughs> Then I said, no, well, you know, well, you can share pregnancy secrets together. And finally, she did take and deliver. So plan your pregnancy by using effective contraception. In Malaysia, currently, there are about 29 million women. There are about under 6 million women who are in the reproductive age group. Let's look at contraceptive uptake. How many women of our in Malaysia use contraception? Less than 50%. What happened to the rest? They just look at the crystal ball, thinking they will not get pregnant. If you compare the effective contraception around, around even in Southeast Asia, we still have a low uptake of contraception. And if you look at MDG, we need to reduce MDG for the last 15 years to reduce maternal mortality in Malaysia to less than one third. For the last 10 years, our maternal mortality in Malaysia is about just about 25 per 100,000 live birth. And we have not been able to reduce it. Why? Because a lot of our women do not use contraception. And in the confidential inquiry into the maternal death, when I'm the one of the member, we discuss women that die. And 70% of women that die never use contraception and they never plan pregnancy. We say you need to plan pregnancy to make sure you're healthy so that you can take the risk of pregnancy, what it takes. Why is it people doesn't use contraception? There's a lot of barriers and myths out there. Women say, if I take oral contraceptive pill, I will gain weight. I do not want to gain weight because I need to wear my skirt. But, you know, gaining weight in contraception, one to two kilograms is water retention. More than is fat, whatever we eat. So stop eating uh, the, those high glucose index um, uh, food. It's not the contraception. But there's also fear of cancer. But a lot of women doesn't know that the powerful non-contraceptive benefits of oral contraceptive pills. There are many papers that have been shown even large epidemiological data in UK, the Royal College of the Practitioners, also the GP, also produces data to show that when you use oral contraception, it reduces the risk of ovarian cancer by about 50 to 70% with more than one year of use. It also reduces the risk of endometrial cancer. There are very few strategies now women have to think in terms of reduction of cancers among women. One is oral contraceptive pill. Two, take the HPV vaccine and make sure you go for your pap smear. How many of you probably never had a pap smear for the last three years for many, many different reasons? So these are the things that we need to, of course, then really stop smoking. And of course, women also say, I do not want to take contraception for the fear of infertility. I take oral contraceptive pill, I stop, and I'll get pre I will get infertile, and I have to see Dr. Nugo Ellis. I have to see Prof. Jaffa for counseling on whether or not somebody can help me to get pregnant. But that's not true. This study is done in 2009, and many studies like this, return of fertility after contraception is within a year, similar to non to women with younger age group who are not using contraception. And in fact, this study was nine, 2009. I did a small study in 1994 with a similar result. Return of fertility after contraception from control cases and the study cases is the same. Therefore, you need not be afraid. So now I'm going to come to almost almost the end part of my lecture. So after contraception, how long are you going to take contraception? Till you menopause, of course. Even you have irregular menses, you can still produce eggs irregularly, and one night stand can still get you pregnant. As I told you, there are millions of sperm fighting for one egg. So therefore, you need to observe contraception right up to menopause. So shall we leave you alone, menopause? Are they going to say this cranky old woman when they reach menopause because of the mood swings? Well, now the 
Every age of lifespan of Malaysian woman is about 72 years old. So we will spend, if we live that long, 20 years our age in menopause. So we might as well embrace menopause gracefully, and the men should help us do that. So when we enter menopause, we lose estrogen. And there are many problems with estrogen. Of course, there are many, uh, many uh, uh, symptoms of estrogen loss. It's hot flushes, night sweat, and so on. But the more important thing is the skeletal, where they tend to get osteoporosis, fracture, cardio, we lose cardiovascular protection. If you get a myocardial infarction post-menopause, our risk of dying is much higher than men of same age having myocardial infarction. And also, of course, genital urinary symptoms. So people are always scared of getting menopause, and they say that when you get menopause, there's always a, risk, a high risk of cancer. But that's true. This is Prof Chi's slide looking at the Malaysian woman. Many women die of all cancers, or many women die of cardiovascular problems rather than cancers. So in Malaysia currently, one woman will die from breast cancer, but many, many women will die from myocardial infarction. Therefore, we need to think about it. But it's not menopause that's at risk. It's not the menopause that increases our risk of getting cardiovascular infarction. It's the risk factors that we actually do. We do not, we still smoke at menopause. We do not check our weight. Obesity is an independent factor, will increase the risk of cancer during menopause and also other cardiovascular risks and also hypertension. So shall we replace all women with estrogen? Well, that's also what we thought 10 years ago. In 1999, we say everybody that goes to menopause lose estrogen and give back estrogen. So there was a big study and looking at this particular effect, shall we give back the woman estrogen? The Women Health Initiative study, which was stopped in 2002. Why? Because there was a big kuha saying that there was eight extra uh, cases of breast cancers, and you have DVTs, PEs, and you said the women are getting crazy, 23 cognitive decline, therefore, we should stop. We should stop. We cannot give them any hormonal replacement therapy. So what happened around the world? Everybody stops hormonal replacement therapy, and women had to suffer in silence. But what? But we need to look at this WHI study. We're not going to do another WHI study. Majority of the patients in WHI study are more than 60 years old. Almost half smokes, almost half are obese, and one third are hypertensive. They are the wrong group. We are studying the wrong group on the effect, but no ethics committee are going to approve another large study anymore. So what are the good things that are coming out of WHI? Well, we know that there are five fewer hip fractures, there are five fewer colorectal fractures, and short-term use did not, use, inc did not increase the breast cancer. Short-term means after five years so. And even ultra doses used low dose current IMS guideline, the International Menopause Guideline says that as low as possible to give this woman will in fact do the trick, will still maintain the bone and will still relieve the symptoms of estrogen loss. So in the nutshell, from the ova towards pregnancy, towards menopause. I think women need to be saluted for your resilience, for your passion, for your patience, and for your silence cooperation. And I think that's what you need to do. So now for the first, last few minutes, I'm just gonna talk about my journey into medical school. I wanted to be a, a doctor right from, well, from school, I think. And I undergo a lot of metamorphosis in medical school. In year one, if you can find me somewhere in this year one, I had a year of fancy scarf on my hair. Year two, I have fancy ribbons on my hair. Braid ribbons, all sorts of ribbons. Year three, I got jagged skirts. I wear all kinds of skirts, all colors of skirts. So the nurses in the audience, they're old enough, they will remember me, a different, different era, year one, year two, year three. And when I graduate, I work as a houseman here. And uh, later on, I went to United Kingdom. You can see that with my husband. He was BMI 17, and now he's BMI 22. He, they say that you have put on a lot of weight. And, and we went to UK with two kids, but we came back with another one, which is Sarah. She's born in the United Kingdom. And among that, I said, I also have a lot of passion in women's health in general, contraception, uh, family planning, vaccination, and menopause. That's how I've, I've organized a lot of lectures or a lot of seminars toward this. 
But I also want to do a lot of things. I can't play bowling as well as my daughter, Illy. Maybe I can throw a few balls straight line, but other than that, no. But I wanted to prove to, to Jamal, to my beloved husband, I can still climb Mount Kinabalu in 2010. He said, yeah, when you reach Laban Rata, call me whether you can climb it or not. <laughs> but I did reach the top, and I took a picture to prove it. And I've also done a lot of community work with medical students, my beloved medical students. We've gone to so many places. We've done a lot of community work with them. I enjoyed my time with you, and I hope you enjoyed my, your time with me. And I just wanted to acknowledge a few people who are very responsible to me being a fetal maternal specialist. When I first started my uh, uh, medical officer in UH, I did my housemanship here. Prof, the late Prof Sinature, Dato Sinature, called me one day to his office and said, Jami, would you like to do ONG and enter SLAP program? That I said, yeah, why not? Because as a medical student, I am always intrigued whenever a fetus is born. From a fetus in the tummy, suddenly screamed for the lung. It always fascinates me. So I said, yes, why not? So I entered SLAP. As what Prof. Adiba just now said, I should be the pioneer of my, uh, the clinical masters in ONG, but I forgot to fill the form the first year. So I thought the slack is automatic to go into the master's program. And later on, the HR said, not automatic, you have to fill in the form. So you wait until next year. So that's the reason why we are in the second batch and not the first batch. And when I finished my, uh, my master's program in 1992, Prof. Siva called me and says, I think maybe you should go and do some subspecialty. I wanted to do infertility, Prof. Jaffa. I thought, yeah, maybe it's interesting to do infertility. Prof. Siva said, no, you cannot do infertility because Christina wants to do that, so you have to do fetal maternal medicine. What is that? <laughs> so I said, what is that, fetal maternal medicine? But Prof. Ra is it like Prof. Raman? So Prof. Raman is an icon in the elden days, self-trained, he's such a darling, and he, he, he do a lot of ultrasound, but sometimes I'm not sure whether he scanned correctly or showed me correctly or not. <laughs> so I said, you're going to be like Prof. Raman. Well, he's not here today. He is, uh, so I said, you'll be like Prof. Raman. I said, yes, Prof. Raman is such a fierce guy. Everybody will pee in the pants when you present to Prof. Raman. But I'm not scared of him. So I said, OK, I shall want to be like Prof. Raman, but simply because I want to see whether he scanned correctly and showed me that's a kidney or not. And and I must say, Prof. Rahman is my, one of my strongest motivators because everybody is so scared of him. And he's a perfectionist. I said, OK, I'll be like you the next time. And Prof. Kula is, Prof. Kula is my mentor for medical students, for masters, and also to academic staff. So just a few people I'd like to acknowledge. But I also got the privilege to work with my boss, Prof. Nick Fish. Waldo Sepulveda, one's an icon in fetal maternal medicine, and Pippa Kyle. And I also had, to, I had a privilege to work with Michael D. Sweet, who's one the icon in maternal medicine. And this is, uh, this is Catherine Nilton Piercy, one of maternal medicine in Queen Charlotte. And this is Andrew Shannon. He's also a fetal maternal medicine in Queen Charlotte, but also the person responsible in delivering Sarah. And this is my awesome family. I'd just like to pay tribute to my husband, Jamal, Ili, Amir, and uh, Sarah uh, for all their love and support. And you see me here, I'm actually a walk walking time bomb. I can write my medical history in a publication. In the first uh, pregnancy, I had E. coli septicemia, and people say that I have 50-50% of surviving. <laughs> And because I had E. coli from uh, sepsis from UTI, catheterization after C-section, and I promised myself subsequently I will take antibiotics even though they do not give me. In the second pregnancy, I was electrocuted at 28 weeks by an iron, you know, a faulty iron, and I was admitted to CCU with Ili in the tummy at 28 weeks. And the Prof. Wan Azman said, you have to be in CCU because we do not know what the shock did to your heart. It means stop. I said, OK, I was the, uh, the only MO on call. And my lecturer covering was a new lecturer from UK. He cursed me because I had to go to CCU. <laughs> and Ely said, maybe that's, because, that's why uh, I'm good at maths, maybe because the electrocution. 
And later on, I had a lot of things in life. I was involved in an accident, in a high profile accident, and I had more than 30 stitches on my face, and they stitched me in A&E under local anesthesia, even though I was like crying uh, on, uh, for three hours, every stitch I can feel. But I'm a patient, so I'll just follow what I said. And also, I was hit by a snatch thief, and I was unconscious for 30 minutes and before they carried me somewhere and before they managed to find my husband. So I was thinking, there's a lot of angels looking after me. So for that, I am grateful for life, and thank you very much for my family for your support. And I'd just like to leave you with this quote, you know, because I feel that life is always very stressful, and in a woman, maybe, you are doing so many things, good job, you are in the workforce, you did wonderful work. When you go home, sometimes you still have to take care of your family. Life can be stressful, but life is also too short. So you need to enjoy everything you do as I do. I enjoy whatever I do, no matter how small, no matter how big. And I think laughter is a good cure to all the stresses. And I think from the love and support of your family, your friends, everything is possible. Thank you very much for listening. Congratulations, Prof. Jamie, and for that brilliant uh, lecture. What can we say? So uh, I now invite Professor uh, Dr. Adiba to conclude the lecture. Thank you. Well, Jamie, we don't expect anything less from you. Thank you for that brilliant journey from the OVA to, um, to the nine lives that you've almost used up. I'm, I'm, one day we'll, we'll uh, compare stories of how many lives uh, both of us have used up to be here. But um, yeah, uh, thank God uh, there are angels looking after you and you're still here with us. Um, so I think, you know, when... when, when uh, I, I dismissed obstetrics and gynecology as a specialty very on, uh, very early on in my training, and I, I must say I've forgotten that. You know, um, what what one of the things that struck me about your lecture was the um, that a 90-year-old man has uh, a six-month-old <laughs> sperm, and uh, our our um, the ova can be. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 40 years old at, at conception, and I guess that's why uh, men are from Mars and uh, <laughs> we women uh, are multitasking. So, um, uh, a brilliant lecture. I, I will not uh, do it injustice by trying to summarize it, but uh, um, I think what you showed us was um, how much one person can contribute from you know, maternal fetal medicine to uh, looking after the abnormalities that can sometimes come from, um, you know, when the immune system goes wrong in, uh, at conception, to um, looking after towards the, the uh, tail end of uh, a, a woman's life, and that's at, at menopause. Um, both the faculty and, and uh, women in general uh, owe a lot to you, um, and, and but particularly the medical students. I think, um, you know, we had a lot of problems with Klang uh, a few years ago. We've always had this uh, unnatural, um, well, how do I put it, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, to put it mildly, a love-hate relationship with our colleagues at Klang until Jamie comes along and, and tries to uh, iron, it out, iron it out and, and smooth things between us. So I think uh, things have improved a great deal, but it, it, it is a measure of her passion, her diplomacy, um, and then her true concern for, for students that she's always able to overcome many of these uh, challenges and barriers. And um, uh, as I said, uh, lots of babies, uh, lots of mothers, and, and, and lots of future doctors uh, uh, owe you a lot for, for who you are. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Professor Adiba, for chairing this lecture. And I think we owe Prof. Jamie a big round of applause. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have almost reached the end of the event. 
I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Prof. Jamie um, and also to thank the management of the Faculty of Medicine, the International Corporate Relations Office, Warga University Malaya, and all of you for taking time to be, with, to be with us this afternoon to celebrate the memorable occasion with us. But before we part, again, in true Prof. Jamie style, we invite Zin Yang to come down and play Isabella.
for that very inspirational um, performance. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the event, and before we part, just to let you know that refreshments will be served at Center Point, which is just one level up. And if you know Prof. Jamie, you will go to this tea that she has got ready for you. And um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you, and have a pleasant afternoon. Uh, maybe, Jamie, you would go up the stage to take a photo session with your family, right? The rest of you, please find your way to center point. Thank you.